The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I.e., when multiple uh, lineages of beneficial uh, mutants are kind of spreading in the population at the same time, right? So when these clones are somehow interfering with each other in the population, you know, how is it that that clonal interference effect kind of plays out in the context of these microbial asexual populations? And in particular, in this uh, in this paper, what they were trying to measure was the distribution of effects of beneficial mutations. Right? So you put a population into some new environment, there may be some beneficial mutations that are possible. And the question is, uh, what is the probability distribution of effects of those benef beneficial mutations? And this is, uh, as you might imagine, a, a very basic quantity that we'd like to understand uh, just to understand how evolution works in sort of new environments. Uh, but it's actually something that's rather difficult to measure. And, and it's, uh, what's interesting here is it's difficult to measure uh, in, in kind of a, for, for maybe a surprising reason. Uh, but I think that this is a, a wonderful example of uh, how you, uh, if, if life gives you lemons, then you make lemonade. Is that, is that the expression? OK. All right, so in this paper, they set out to try and measure the distribution of effects of beneficial mutations. They were unsuccessful, right? but they were unsuccessful for an interesting reason. So then they were able to write uh, what I think is a very nice uh, science paper. Okay. Um, are there any questions about uh, where we are or administrative things before we get going? Yeah. Right. Um, all right, so just to recap where we were from uh, from last time, right, we introduced uh, this Moran model in which there's a fixed population size n. Right, and each of these sort of uh, cycles, what we do is we, uh, we choose one individual to, uh, to divide, and we choose uh, one individual to be replaced. And we have the daughter, say, cell, replace the, um, re replace the, the cell that was chosen for replacement. Right, now, in that model, uh, what we found was that there's some probability x1 for uh, a new mutant with relativeness r to actually fix in the population. And this, uh, this is in the case of no clonal interference. Okay, so ci will, in general, be clonal interference today. Right? So this is, this is uh, if there's just this one mutation that we're considering, then the, the question of surviving stochastic extinction kind of at the beginning is equivalent to the question of uh, being able to fix in the population for, uh, for certainly for a, for a beneficial mutation with R greater than 1. Okay. So what we want to do today to just start is to try to think about how we can use this model and, and, and this equation uh, in order to understand the probability of, uh, of fixation when there's more than one mutant in the population. Okay. Right, so here what we found is that this thing, there are two, uh, two limits that we might want to keep track of. Right? So this thing goes to 1 over n for neutral mutations. And it goes to uh, s uh, for, um, for moderately beneficial mutations. Okay. For, uh, so s is defined as r minus 1. Okay. So this, it's this for s kind of greater than 0, but for uh, n for s times n uh, much larger than 1. Okay. So I guess this already says that s is greater than 0, so we could ignore that. But, but. Okay. Are there any questions about, uh, about this before we get going to practice using it. All right, so I just wanted to have us consider a few possible situations. All right. All right, population size 10. So what we want to do is consider a situation where there are uh, two mutants. Uh, and we're going to ca call them A and B, all right, with uh, relative fitness RA. 1.01 and RB 0.99. So A is a beneficial mutant and B is a deleterious mutant. Right? 
Uh, and in all of these problems, we're going to assume that the rest of the population has, uh, has fitness 1. All right, so these fitnesses of A and B, they're uh, as compared to the rest of the population. So in this case, there are eight other individuals with relative fitness 1. And so uh, the question is, what is the probability that A fixes? All right, takes over the population, reaches uh, number of A individuals equal to 10. Right? At that stage, we're not allowing for any new mutations here. So then that's the end of the dynamics. Yeah. So you can start thinking about it. And I will give some options here. model, what is the probability that A fixes? I'll give you 20 seconds to think about it. Do you need more time? Oh, all right, let's go ahead and vote and see where we are. Ready? Three, two, one. All right, we got some, uh, I'd say B, C's is kind of the dominant. All right, so that's it. There's, there's generally a disagreement uh, between B and C. Uh, yeah, I think that there's an, I mean, it's almost 50-50. Uh, it is a bit splotchy somehow. You may need to uh, make some effort to find somebody that disagrees with you, but please do so. All right, turn to a neighbor and uh, try to convince them that you're right. <laughs> Um, 
correct decision to try to think about it intuitively instead of trying to get through all the math. Yes. Um, <laughs> Always good to think about things intuitively. Rather than, you know, that's a, a, a huge play. Okay. Uh, uh, so A is very slightly beneficial, and so it, it's just a little bit uh, more likely to fix than a neutral position. And okay, and, and how can we quantify this statement? Right. That. That um, I know I said that I didn't like math, but you know every now and then we should look at it. All right. So yeah. So the statement that A is approximately a neutral mutation. How how is it that we can? How do we know that? I mean, did we have a criteria for nearly neutral? Yes, we have a criteria for nearly neutral. Right. So what is, what is that? What does it mean to be nearly neutral? Uh, the magnitude of S times N is much, much less than one. That's right. S times N is much less than one. It means that it's nearly neutral. What that means is that the probability of fixing is the same as if it were a neutral mutation, or approximately the same. And does, is, that, is that the case here? Yes. Yes. S is 0 0.01, so 1 one-hundredth. And it's 10, so S times N is equal to 0 0.1, right? Which means that, uh, oh, you know, so A is maybe nearly neutral. Is B nearly neutral? Yes. Yes, so both A and B are nearly neutral. Right. One of them is an advantageous mutant, and one's a deleterious. But in this population size, they both behave as if they're nearly neutral. Right. But in a larger population, right, so if we had a million individuals, would these be neutral mutations? Yeah. No. Okay, right, so the question of whether something behaves as a neutral mutation depends upon the population size via this relation. Okay. Uh, all right, so then, okay, so that's, that's okay. And then, and then how do we go from there? Well, the, the, um, the probability of a neutral mutation in yeah. the population is going to be one of random. That's right. A neutral mutation will fix the probability of one group. Okay. Right. So indeed, we're going to get this. And, 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 you know, and we need to highlight that we can, you have to be very careful about just sticking things into formulas. Right? So even though you, know, you may remember that the probability of a beneficial mutant fixing um, in the population is, is S. But that's only for S times N being much larger than 1. And that's only when there's no clonal interference, when, there, when, you're, when you don't have to compete with other beneficial mutants in the lineage. All right, we're going to see an example of this in a moment. Okay. But if you just have a single mutant in the population that's beneficial in the sense of it's not, it's not neutral, right, then the probability of fixation is S. You know, and of course, this, this is nonsensical, right? Because you can't, I mean, it, it wouldn't make any, it would certainly, it would, you know, given that you say, oh, well, if it were neutral, it would fix with a probability of 10%. And then you say, oh, but if it's an advantageous mutant, you know, it can't fix with a probability less than that, right? Okay. So, it's, all right, so this is nearly neutral. Fixation probability is 10%. Okay. Are there any questions about that argument? All right, so let's consider a different problem. All right. All right, so now we're going to consider a population larger. Uh, so it's going to be the same situation where we have these two mutants present uh, as, as single, single individuals. So what we want to know now is the probability that B fixes. Once again, you should start thinking about this while I type in. Okay. Oh, but there was one other thing I wanted to say actually over here. Um, if we modeled this, these population dynamics using differential equations, right? So instead of doing the Moran process where we have stochastic dynamics of, of division, replacement, and so forth, but if you write down a differential equation describing this situation, okay, what is the probability that A fixes? I'm going to give you five seconds. One. All right, one. Okay, I'm fine. All right. All right. Okay, so you don't get to vote. Indeed, yeah. one. Okay. All right. So if you had written down differential equation, then there's no randomness there. Whichever mutant has the largest fitness will fix with probability one. Okay. Okay, probably B fixes.
this you show me both cards. Yeah, I'll give you uh, I'll give you 20, 30 seconds. Yes. Is there just one in the beginning? Yes. Um, all right, so this is kind of, that's why, yeah, so it's just the same thing, yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, a single A mutant and a single B mutant. Yeah. All right, single A, single B, uh, but you should know how to calculate these things if I tell you that they were other similar numbers. So in general, if you don't look at me when I ask that question, I'm going to take that as meaning that you're still thinking about it. Is that, is that, is that how I should interpret that? Okay. Let's go ahead and vote just so that we can uh, see where we are. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. Oh, right. Uh, okay, we're, yeah, we're, we're all over the place. That's great. Uh, because that, that's, that's, that means your neighbor will either be able to help you or confuse you or do something. All right, so let's, um, let's, let's go ahead. All right, so all right, there's a million. Yeah, pop, published size a million. We have two mutants in the population. One has relative fitness two, one has relative fitness of um, an advantage of, of um, 1%. Okay. Uh, one thing to be careful of here is uh, the equation that we have for uh, probability of fixation, fixation here. Ah, uh, there's, there's one more thing that I should say. It's for um, S, well, it's an S much less than 1. Okay. Just for. So this is for a moderately beneficial mutation. Otherwise, you have to use the full equation. Yes? All right, go ahead and turn to your neighbor and uh, try to convince them that you uh, you can stop. So everybody should be talking to somebody. What do you think? Um, well, it's okay to not know, but that's why you, uh, that's why you, you can, you, uh, you should either join them or, um, you know, or if you look behind you, there's someone else that looks very, uh, all right, why don't, let's, okay, let's, uh, what's that? That's always good reason. You know, I, it'll be, they'll be educational. <laughs> all right, let's, uh, let's, let's go ahead and, and reconvene.
Okay, uh, I know that there, there were a lot of different, uh, different guesses on this problem, which means that uh, it may be that the conversations were, uh, were scattered or difficult, or it was difficult to uh, converge. But I, I, still, let's see, let's see if uh, it made any difference. Ready? Three, two, one. Okay. All right, yeah, so I'd say that the, the conversations have helped. Uh, but, we, but we're still pr you know, a fair distribution between maybe A, C, and D still. Okay? Um, but uh, yeah, somebody want to give an explanation for one of those three or something else? Yeah, Jean. Yeah, right. Perfect. Okay, now, I just want to make sure that we all agree on this logic. All right, so if the only thing we had was mutation B, yeah, then the probability of fixation would be 1% because um, in that case, is this a nearly neutral mutation? No, right? So that means that uh, its probability of fixation is going to be uh, around S, in this case, one, uh, 0.01. Okay, but? That's right. So in these cases, he's not going to fix. Exactly. Can I answer C? But I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit of a. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it's. Uh, uh, no, but that's, that's, that's precisely what's happening. So the, for B to fix, it requires two things to happen, right? First, B has to survive stochastic extinction. Okay. Um, you know, and, okay. So we're going to multiply these probabilities. Um, A doesn't survive. We're going to discuss in a moment what this really means in terms of surviving stochastic extinction. But the, you know, when a new mutation appears in a population, it will either relatively quickly go extinct or it will relatively quickly become established, is what we call that. What that means is that it will, if it's a beneficial mutation, it will take over unless it's outcompeted by someone else. So it has to be that B survives stochastic extinction, and A doesn't survive uh, the, this initial phase. Okay. Right. And this thing, all right. So the prob so that means that the probability that B fixes is going to be well. Okay. The probability that B survives stochastic extinction is going to be one percent. Right. The probability that A survives is a half. So the probability that it doesn't survive is also a half. Now, the half, just to remind ourselves, comes from this thing x1 for a, right? There's this 1 over Okay, This thing is what? Zero right, so, right, so this thing very quickly goes to 0, right? So this is 1 half to the millionth power. Okay, so that's 0. So we just get 1 minus a half. Yes? But are we, what are we assuming? The question here to me in this case is we're assuming they're completely independent and we can multiply that's right. together. So yeah, that's right. Uh, and in, in, I would say that for, from the standpoint of a population of a million, these are totally uh, non interacting processes you know, in, in, you know, uh, for all intents and purposes. You know, if, you, if you were down to a population size of 10, then you might have to worry that. that um, that they're going to interact more, but you know, in the in this process of, um, of you know, in this Moran process, you know, you have a million individuals. It's true that this is twice as likely to be chosen to divide as a normal cell, but you're talking about a million cells in that population, right? So the 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 correction to the things that you're worrying about is of order is a part in ten to the six. So the thing, okay. the thing is, is, yeah, um, but if R A and R B were closer, actually, that correction. No. It's not about how, how close RA and RB are to each other. Um, you know, even if they had the exact same relative fitness, even if they were both 2 or both 1.01, then they would still be non-interacting. That's just because they're in this sea of individuals. But the thing that I'm worried about is, for example, RA could take over quickly, and then RB could take over. Right? And that okay, uh, would not be right. for better. Okay, so um, and that's not reasonable in this case. If RA takes over, then RB 
effective RB. Okay, function. right. Okay, so there is one problem. Right. Okay, so I should be careful. If the if the two if the two mutants have exactly the same fitness, then if they both survive stochastic extinction, they're gonna then they, they then you can describe everything as a differential. I mean, and this is this is the distinction in, between this initial phase of trying to become established as compared to the later dynamics. And that uh, the established means that uh, if it's a beneficial mutation, it will spread and basically deterministically, right? So in that situation, if you had two mutants, both of relative fitness uh, 1.01, then they both would try to survive stochastic extinction. And let's say that they both did. Then they would both uh, spread in the population exponentially. Of course, uh, given that the initial dynamics are stochastic, then um, it would still be the case that one of them would just happen to be above the other one. And then, but then they, would then they would grow exponentially together. Uh, that's a more complicated situation than what we're going to um, discuss. And that would actually be very rare, right? Because each one of these mutants would only have a 1% chance of surviving. So only 1 in 10 to the 4 kind of times would you end up with both of these mutants surviving stochastic extinction, right? Okay. Any other questions about, OK, so I just want to be clear here. So this is. Um, you know, this is when a is equal to one. You know, the number of a individuals is one, and the number of b individuals is equal to one, right? Okay. Um, there was a question. What, what if we started with a equal to ten, right? So um, let's say that yeah. Let's say actually, in both, let's say we start with ten a and ten b, for example. Right, so instead of starting with uh, just one mutant A, one mutant B, now we have 10 of each. Right, so we're changing things symmetrically. Right? What's going to be the probability that B fixes you know, approximately? All right, this is going to be a little funny somehow. But OK, well, <laughs> um, just think about it for 15 seconds. What's going to be the probability that B fixes if, um, in this case, All right, I'm worried you guys are not even trying. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, so what I want to know is, so, so we just did the problem when we had a, a single mutant A and a single mutant B. And we found that probably the B fixes was 0 0.005. Now what I want to know is, does anything change if instead of having a single A and single B, now what we have is 10A, 10B, and then the rest of them just being relative fitness 1. So it's not fancy math, but it still gets you a little confused, OK? I, I just want to uh, see where we are. OK, we'll use the same options here, okay. um, may, you know, whatever's closest. And we can argue about what close means in a moment. All right, ready? Uh, three, two, one. OK. All right, so yeah. All right, so it's kind of some A's and B's, some E's. All right. Um, OK, well, OK, well, we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, all right, I, I, maybe I'll, we'll jump ahead to the group discussion just because I don't want to spend too much time on this problem. But these are, these are the kinds of problems I think it's very important to, to practice with because they just develop your intuition for the stochastic dynamics that occur in populations. Right. Um, OK, so let's, let's you know, it's going to be something like B. I, you know, that's not where I put, why I put B in there. Because, but OK, but let's just see how it goes. It's going to be, all right, and, and the way to find the answer here is the same as what we did before, except that now we have to think about these processes somewhat differently. OK, so first of all, uh, in order for B to fix, it requires that B, still B has to survive stochastic extinction. Okay? So we still have the, the same 0 0.01 here. Okay? But now we have to think about the probability that A doesn't survive. Okay? And, and that's going to change now, right? Oh, I, I, I should be, OK. 
Yeah, OK, so no, this is not. OK, I forgot that we had 10 here. Um, it's, I mean, we could calculate what it is. And actually, maybe we should have. Oh, yeah, well, let's just, yeah, no, let's, let's calculate that. All right, so this is x1 for b. Um, we still have you know, 1.01 to the million. So this is, we can still ignore this bottom part. Um, Right? But what it's going to be is, oh, no, but that, this is x10 of b, right? We have 10 individuals. So this is 1 minus 1.01 to the 10th power. Yeah? So we have interference. Right, OK. So this, this, is, this is as if, this, right now what we're trying to understand is if only we had b, well, you know, this is, the, this is the probability that, of, we're trying to calculate this, this part of it. All right, so if we ignore A, what's probably B survives stochastic extinction? Um, right, so this is, uh, oh, this is fine. Okay, so this is, this is yeah, so it's, it's a modest, it's a modest change, right? Okay, so this is, because this is going to be 1 minus, uh, so this thing is around 1.1, 1. 1, right? Because, 1 plus x to the n is around 1 plus nx for nx much less than 1. Right? OK. So this is 1.1. OK, so this is, OK. Am I going crazy? OK, OK, yes. okay so right, right. So we, we had to get rid of 1. OK, so this is around 0.1, right? OK, so indeed, my, you know, I had forgotten that there was 10. OK, so, all right, so, so given that we have 10 of these B individuals starting, right, they may survive. You know, in the, we're ignoring A right now, just on their own dynamics. They, they may survive, or they may drift down to 0 and go extinct. Right? And indeed, even starting with 10 individuals, 10 B individuals, you actually still expect them to go extinct. Right? This actually calculation is very relevant for what we're about to think about, which is this question of what does it mean to be established in a population? And already you can kind of see what it's going to mean. Right? How big do you need to get in the population before you're likely to survive? 1 over s. right? This is Because you can basically see how this is going to work out in this calculation, that the number, to be, the, the number you have to get to to be established is around 1 over s. Okay, so in this case, you have to get to around 100 individuals before you ha are going to be more likely than not to survive. Okay. Okay. Let's see if we can figure out this problem. All right. So we had 0.1 was the pr uh, probably the b would survive stochastic extinction. Okay. But then in in order for b to fix, it has to not only survive stochastic extinction, but also a has to not survive. Okay. And uh, we can figure out what that is going to be here. All right. Th this this is that term. All right. And then we uh, we need another one. All right, so this is, this is x of 10 of a, right? And this is, again, going to be 1 minus 1 half to the 10th power. Yeah, right. So it's always good to memorize a few of these things. 2 to the 10 is approximately 1,000, right? Oh, but we want not this, right? So we're going to subtract this 1 away. So we're going to get 10 to the minus 3. Do you guys see how that, right? So given that we start with 10 individuals of A with relative fitness 2, then there's only a 1 in 1,000 chance that, that those A individuals are going to uh, go extinct. Okay. All right, so the probability that B is going to fix in this situation is rather close to 10 to the minus 4. OK, so I don't you know. So it's somewhere in between there. But. Are there any questions about how that came about? I feel like there's a fair amount of unhappiness. Um, so it could be the logic of this, or it could be the calculation of one of the two terms, or it could be something else. Yes? Sorry, uh, where did you get x10b, the probability of x of uh, b 
You, you want to know this term or that term? First term. Okay, the first term. Right. So the first term is just asking uh, in, if, if there were no A, right, right. Okay, what would be the probability that B would survive stochastic extinction? That's the same as the probability that it would, uh, that it would fix because it's a beneficial mutation and if, if B is the only thing, right? And then so we use this equation. Oh, okay. So that's yeah, so we use, we use this equation except that this thing just goes to 1, so we're just left with this. But we have to. This equation is assuming that there's just one of the mutant individuals. Otherwise, if we, you know, if you say x sub i, then it's r to the i here. All right. So that was the equation that was derived in, in chapter six of, of evolutionary dynamics. Okay. But I think that that's not the only thing that people are unhappy about. So please. No? Yes? A question one, why don't you need to uh, take into account B doesn't survive, that probability that B doesn't survive for the first question that's on the board right now, I guess? For the nearly, nearly neutral case? Oh, OK. So this was the very first one that we did? Oh, OK. Um, all right, so you want to know. Like, why, why don't you need to take into account the probability okay. that B doesn't survive? All right, so in, in this problem, it's just that they all behave as if they were just neutral. So the probability of each of these 10 individuals fixing in the population is the same, essentially. Right? And, and they, so they each have a 1 in 10 probability of surviving. And, and in this case, I would say that if, if things are nearly neutral, you don't talk about this idea of surviving stochastic extinction. Because it's all going to be, it's, you, know, you can't get big enough to the point where you will are you know where you're really guaranteed to survive stochastic extinction because even if you've gone to occupy 75% of the population right what's your probability of fixing at that stage if you're nearly neutral and you get up to 75% you have a 75% chance of fixing right so so there, there's no uh, in the case of n neutral mutations uh, there's no analogous idea of what it means to be um, to be established because you could always just go back and go extinct with, with finite probability. Okay. Okay. Right. This question, OK, well, you know, it, it's looking more and more likely to show up on the midterm on, in, in two weeks. All right, so now is your opportunity to ask a question about it. If, um, can, you, can you talk about an established? How you got it, what it means? Yes. Okay, this is a good question. All right. All right, so when we talk about a mutation becoming established, that you know that's asking uh, uh, so we know that even a rather beneficial mutation, say something that confers an advantage of a few percent, will probably go extinct. Okay? Uh, however, if it gets up to be a large enough uh, fraction or number in the population, then uh, it should then the dynamics are going to be well described by a differential equation where it won't go extinct. Okay, so this is for, um, this is for um, this is established mutation. And this, this again, we, we really talk about only for, for beneficial mutations. Because other, other mutations can't really get established. They could still stochastically fix, but it's stochastic up to the very end. Okay. Um, right, so the question is, at what number in the population do you have to get before you are expected to take over the population, okay, assuming that other, other, other new mutants don't arise. Okay. And let me, um, right. So this we can ask, that corresponds to asking, OK, what, this is the probability of fixation when you have i individuals in the population. So this is just, I mean, OK, so, and this is, this is what we saw before. OK, this is for mutation with relative fitness r. You have i individuals in the population, total population size n. Right? But what we want to know, and, and this becoming established means that xi is approximately equal to 1. Right? Uh, now, in, in, in these situations, it's going to be r to the n is, again, very, very large. So this thing we can ignore. So this is really the same thing as asking that 1 minus, right? And this never gets to be exactly equal to 1. 
But what then we're really asking is that this thing is close to 1, i.e., we can, and it's equivalent to saying that, what do we want to say? That 1 over r to the i is much less than 1. Okay? And, uh, right, well, that means that r to the i is much greater than 1. <laughs> So this is, this is really saying that what you want is i times s to be much greater than 1. Uh, and this is then, so, so n established, which is in this case, this, this, it's the i such that this is true, um, right, has to be much greater than 1 over s. Okay. And indeed, I think that when when i is equal to 1 over s, then you, the probability of fixation is, um, or you know, I think it's the probability of extinction is 1 over e, if you kind of do the, do the math. OK, so that means that this is kind of the crossing over point where you're more likely than not to survive. Okay. Right, and just to be concrete, for many of the mutations we're, going to be, we're talking about and that you read about in Roy's paper, uh, S was a few percent. Right? So this is saying that the population is established when the number of these mutants gets up to above 30 or you know, a few times 30, so maybe 100 individuals, means that it's unlikely to go extinct stochastically. Okay? So it's really, it's once you get to this N established, then the population will grow exponentially in the population. And it's going to spread exponentially with an advantage s relative to the rest of the population. Okay? So this discussion is actually very useful for the next thing we want to talk about. But yeah, it does, are there any questions about how we got this? Right, yeah. Right, so the probability of going extinct is, um, this is the probability of going extinct? Yeah. OK, so the, the probability of going extinct here, if you have i individuals, is, is, is 1 over this guy. So it's 1 over 1 plus s to the i. Right, and then if i times s is 1, but s is small, OK, I mean, this is, uh, you know, this is one of those definitions of, of e to the x that, I don't know, do you guys remember this? Uh, it's, it's like, oh my goodness, e to the x is the limit <laughs> No, no, x is up there, OK. Uh, boy, Ian, this, you guys are taxing me. All right. Um, this is x over n to the n. And this is the limit as n goes to infinity. Is this? Yes. Do we agree? OK. This makes sense, right? Um, right, so you, I mean, it just if, if it, right, so this is, this is just an equivalent to saying that if i times s equal to 1, but s is small, then this thing is around e. OK. Um, if you're confused by, I, I don't want, I don't want to get into this too much because it's not quite central to what we're talking about. But uh, come up and talk to me after the class, and we'll derive this together. Okay. But um, right. So the idea is that when when you've reached a population size of one over s, then you have a one over e probability of um, going extinct. Okay. So e pops up at all sorts of weird locations. This is why you hear about it. Okay. Um. All right, so what I want to do now is I want to discuss this uh, idea of uh, clonal interference a little bit more. In particular, ask, all right, in what situation um, will we have clonal interference? Or equivalently, when can we ignore clonal interference? All right, can somebody say in words that when we're going to be able to ignore the effect of clonal interference? Yes. Population size is so large that there's a very limited time to 
OK, I think we're going to have to be careful here. All right, so because you, you're saying, oh, well, if the population is large enough, then the, you're saying, oh, the mutations won't interact, right? Not at the beginning. Well, they don't interact at the beginning. I think that's, that statement I'm very happy with. But the problem is that if they both survive stochastic extinction and they start spreading, then they really do, and then they do start to interact in this large population. Right. They behave deterministically, but the thing is that if you have two subpopulations that are exponentially growing, and there are these very nice diagrams that I guess in Roy's paper they don't show, which is if you, if you look at the, somehow the population okay, um, kind of changing as a function of time, right, you can think about, OK, well, there's some, this is, let's say, constant population size. right, And it starts out all being a particular type. Okay, we'll say um, there's you know some population type A. But now a new mutation arises and survives stochastic extinction. It starts spreading in the population. All right, this may be mutant B. Okay, but then if another mutant appears over here that's even more fit, then it can actually spread faster, and indeed it can cause the B lineage to get outcompeted. Right, so we start out with population A. Mutation B is more fit than A. You know, mutant B is more fit than A. It's spreading exponentially. But sometime later, mutation C appears. Right? Now, this C lineage is more fit than B, so it's able to spread exponentially. And indeed, it outcompetes B. Okay. So this is, this is exactly what we mean by clonal interference. These two lineages are interfering with each other. So this thing is, this is indeed clonal interference. Uh, and th there have been these drawings out you know, for maybe 20 years. People have been thinking about this. Like Lenski wrote some classic papers thinking about this. Uh, recently, Michael Desai at Harvard has done some really beautiful work where he takes these evolving yeast populations. He does high resolution, um, now resolution in both senses, temporal as well as deep, kind of deep sequencing in the population, where he can actually directly see uh, see these, these lineages spreading and then being outcompeted. And he sees multiple mutations kind of spreading through the population together because they, got it, they were attached on some genome. It's really uh, it's a very nice paper. Uh, I almost had you guys read it. So it's, it's maybe Nature in 2012, 13? I don't know. Possibly 12. So this, this is the idea of clonal interference. Okay. So it's, it's after the initial stochastic dynamics have played out. Yes? This, this factor of the half that we derived, you call that clonal Yeah, so that, that is a result of clonal interference, right? Because it's saying that that, you know, that half arises because if, you know, B maybe, if it did survive, it may still get outcompeted by A. So that's, that's, that's clonal interference. Right, so the idea is that they don't interact initially. Because when, when the mutations are present at a very low frequency, then they're really interacting with the bulk, the rest of the population, but 10 to the 6 there. Okay. However, if they survive stochastic extinction and they start spreading in the population, then there's the possibility of clonal interference. So wouldn't that change that one half into something else? No, I think that's why it's a half. Right. Because this factor of a half is really just saying that you know, even if B survives stochastic extinction, it only has a 50-50 shot of actually being able to take over because there's a 50% chance it's going to be, it's going to experience clonal interference with this A lineage that's going to outcompete it. Okay. Right. Uh, you know, maybe if, you know, if, they're, if you're unhappy about that statement, you harass me afterwards. Okay, so, but, all right, so from this discussion, though, um, how can we think about the importance of clonal interference? In particular, uh, there are going to be two time scales. And uh, the question of whether there's going to be significant clonal interference is related to wh which of these time scales is larger. Right? All right, so what, what might the time scales be?
or at least one of the time scales. Right, to be established. To reach the size being established. Okay. Yeah, as it turns yeah, so this actually ends up not being um, no, but it, you know, but it's very um, right, so the actual time that it takes from when a mutation appears to when it becomes established is um, I mean there is a time time there, but it's um, it ends up not being the relevant thing because that's the regime where they're not actually uh, interacting with that the mutant lineages are not interacting anyways, right? So there's a sense that it doesn't quite matter how long that takes, at least to first order. How much time it takes to reach, reach subpopulation size that it will? Right. OK, so yeah. So I think so one of them is going to be that the, it's the time to go from established to fixation. Right. So it's actually the next time scale there. And actually, the time to get established is actually rather short because the lineages that, you know, so a mutation appears, it most of the time goes extinct, but the ones that don't go extinct actually get established rather quickly, right? You know, it's because that's a biased sampling over the trajectories, um, right? But, but there is a rather significant time that it takes for the lineage to go from being established to actually fixing in the population. So this is kind of how long it takes for a mutation to take over a population, All right? So we, um, we might call this the time to spread or so. And it turns out that that time, yeah, what is it going to depend on? It's going to depend on s. Right, so it, as s goes up, then this goes down. Okay. All right, perfect. All right, let's just go put a 1 over s there. All right, this, and this, this is because it's going to grow exponentially in the population. Okay. And then uh, what, how else is it going to depend on? n. n. Right. And indeed, uh, this is going to be the log of n times s. It's really n over n established. Because right? the idea is that you start out at n established, you grow exponentially with rate s until you kind of take over the population, size n. Okay. And this, this s appears because it's 1 over n established. Because this in, in the log is really like kind of the population size divided by n established. OK, so this is one time scale. All right. Do you guys understand why it should be like this? OK. All right. And what's the other time scale that's relevant here? Yeah? How fast um, mutations occur? How fast mutations? Yes. So how long you have to wait from one mutation to the next mutation? Right. OK, so this is, this is how long you have to wait for one mutation. All right. So this is, this is t. T we call it, might call T mutation, all right. Now it's a little bit subtle to think about what this is going to, what what this should be, right? But it should ha say something about the time it takes for mutations to appear in the population, right? So we'll um, let's go ahead and just guess what this might be for T mutation should be equal to what, all right? So it could be. Um, yeah, right. So, this, right, yeah, so, I, I, you know, so I guess I'm trying to get you to think about what this should mean to be relevant for determining the time scales of whether clonal interference is important. Mu is the probability per generation of having a beneficial mutation of magnitude s. Okay. Mu is, the, um, is, is, you know, is kind of the mutation rate, is what, you know. Right, but we'll just assume that 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 there's only one kind of beneficial mutation, and every beneficial mutation has magnitude s for simplicity, right? So it's mutation rate per you know it's a beneficial mutation rate per generation of, of leading to mutation s. Um, and you can just also say if you're if you have no idea why what I'm talking about. But I just, you know, it's worth spending a little bit, bit of time thinking about what should be the relevant time scale to compare to this. Yes? So mu is per uh, organism in the buffer? Yes. That's right. Yeah. 
And it's OK if you find this confusing, because this is, this is subtle. But if you think about it for 30 seconds, then maybe you'll be you know, fertile ground to, 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 for the discussion to follow. All right, let's go ahead and vote and see where we are. Ready? Three, two, one. All right. I, I, all right. This is very nice. OK, almost everybody is saying C, although um, it really should be D. OK? Um, that OK, that's an interesting statement. Um, all right, so uh, S, I mean, I guess I, this is a relative fitness. Uh, but you, right there, you have S needs the time. What about time? Boy, it's a good, uh, you know. Yeah, so the problem is that this is, a, this is all in units of, of generation time, right? So this is, cause this is really t telling us about the number of generations. Um, so um, what is going on? That's an interesting. Uh, because one over mu n should also be a time, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if it, yeah, I mean, since this is all in generations, I'm not sure if you even have to. Um, yeah, I, I think it's OK. Um, I, I like that statement, but then that's not you know no, I, yeah. But then he you know I mean yeah yeah no. But he but then he hit, this should have units of time. I mean I guess the the I, I I agree with your statement, but I also you know sort of agree with his. That if one over s, you know I mean that's the problem. Yeah, but I think that it's really that it's all you know it's all because everything's in units of generation, so it's it's really that all it's all unitless except for mu. Yeah. What I don't understand is why the how beneficial. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. It's, it, this is subtle. OK. All right, so let's imagine th this is time. OK. Now, 1 over mu n is telling us um, how, mu how, how, how much time there is between the initial appearance of these beneficial mutants. All right. All right, so here we get a beneficial mutation. All right, but what do you, you think is going to happen to that beneficial mutation? Ah, yeah, that guy's dead. E comes up. OK. All right. How long do we have to wait before the next beneficial mutation? 1 over mu n. Is it going to be exactly that? Is it going to be peaked around that? All right. The, all right. Verbal answer. What is going to be the probability distribution between successive appearances of this beneficial mutation? Ready? 3, 2, 1. It's exponentially distributed. OK? So there might be another one that's going to appear here. What do you think is going to happen to that guy? Oh, he's dead. Yeah, OK. Um, all right, another one. OK, so these guys are appearing at, right? But if, if the magnitude of S is, is say, 0.02, that means we have to wait for 50 of these things to appear before we expect that one of them is actually going to get established. And established means it gets up to 1 over S, right? So this guy, once he's established, he's going to grow exponentially in the population. Okay. But the idea is that the time scale here of 1 over mu n is the time between successive appearances of this beneficial mutation, whereas 1 over mu n s is the time scale between successive establishments of these beneficial mutations. And it's only if they get established that they're relevant. Okay. So that's why what w w the T mutation established is 1 over mu n s. Okay. All right. Now, no clonal interference means that one of these is larger than the other one. Okay. Which, all right, so, wit, so no clonal interference means is it a, this guy is larger, or B, this guy is larger. 
OK, this is larger, question mark, this one, that one. All right, think about this for 15 seconds just to make sure that we're, all right, make sure. We're asking, if there's no clonal interference, it means that one of these is much larger than the other one. Which one? OK, ready? Three, two, one. OK, it means that this thing is much larger than this one, right? So it, this thing has to be much larger than t, t establish to fix, OK? Right? Because if it's the case, this time scale is very large compared to this time scale spreading, then the mutations don't ever uh, clonally interfere. Okay. Um, I think it's very important that you uh, can reconstruct this whole argument because it has all the ingredients of the dynamics in terms of stochastic uh, and then uh, deterministic and, and you know. And everything. So uh, if if you if you find this stuff confusing, please. Uh, Go through it with a friend or uh, come to me after class. All right, so what, um, what do we want to do for the last 20 minutes is then uh, is talk about Roy's paper. Okay? Um, and I, I think that this, this paper is, is interesting and, and um, subtle. It's a little bit hard to tell how much of it is, uh, is an experimental kind of straight up demonstration or how much of it is that it's just a way of getting you to think new thoughts. I would, um, it certainly is a way to get you to think new thoughts. At least it very much got, uh, I, f I felt that it had that effect on me. And that, um, I, you know, after reading it, I, got, I just got, you know, very excited about all the dynamics that were at play here and how, uh, you know, out of the complexity of this colonial interference process, maybe in some cases there might be some uh, even simpler phenomenological type description of what was going on. Uh, but I think that what is very interesting about that paper is this idea that what they really wanted to measure was this probability distribution of beneficial mutations. Okay? So what we mean by that is that different beneficial mutations will have different effects. right? And in particular, you can imagine a thought experiment where you take an E. coli cell. Uh, how how um, how big is the E. coli genome, roughly? Um, this is an, just like it's always good to have guideposts for how long ago things happened. It's also good to have guideposts for things like a few, just good to have a few genome sizes kind of memorized, right? Uh, now, does anybody know the E. coli genome? 2,000 base pairs? <laughs> okay, no, no, I, no, I just want to make sure that we're. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, so yeah, it's, it's a bit more than that. But yeah, so it's. Um, it's a, it's a few million base pairs, right? Three or four, depending on the strain. Okay? But you can imagine a thought experiment where you go in and for, at every base pair, you make, um, you make the three possible point mutations. Okay? So then you can imagine having 10 million different strains that are each different at one site. Okay? And then what we can do is we can plot the, the, the rate of population growth in some environment. All right, so this is gamma. It's the 1 over n dn dt, you know, basically division rate, normalized by um, the wild type division rate. OK. I'm sorry. I'm, that's supposed to be down there. So this is, this is gamma uh, over gamma of wild type. And this could be you know, E. coli in. LB or minimal media or you know at 30 C I pick some reasonable environment okay the question is if you draw the histogram of what this thing should look like you know what should it be all right now what I'm going to ask you to do is in 30 seconds draw something on your sheet of paper all right so this is this is what I'm this is, I'm trying this is supposed to be a frequency or a histogram over those 10 million point, point mutations, right? So we haven't actually done this experiment, but I think it's um, people have been doing some. Uh, they actually ha we have made uh, all possible gene knockouts in uh, in E. coli, so removing each of each of the genes, right? Uh, and we've we've done that in, in E. coli. We've done it in yeast, and indeed in yeast they're actually making and measuring the division rate for all pairwise knockouts. Right, so there, there, there are some 
fraction of the way through, they published their first 10 million measurements for the division rate of the pairwise knockouts in yeast. This is Charlie Boone at Toronto. It's an amazing data set. Okay. But all right, this, is a, sorry, this is a simpler one. All right, so this is just if we make a histogram of the growth rate of E. coli, all possible, all 10 million possible point mutations in E. coli, what do you think it's going to look like? All right, and I'm going to come by. And if I don't see a distribution drawn on your sheet of paper, then you can, um, you, you'll get to draw it up here on the board for all of us. OK. Um. <laughs> totally a distribution. OK, OK. <laughs> All right. Um. <laughs> all right. Yeah, what I find interesting about this exercise is that you get uh, all possible distributions, uh, <laughs> which is um, no, but it's funny because it's it's like the, a super basic question, right? Um, and somehow we don't necessarily think about it or whatnot, right? Um, all right, can somebody throw out kind of what they think maybe should be going on? Yeah. OK, right, so it could be just that, all right, so it could be that they're all here. You know, most will, or maybe not most, but a large fraction will be killed. Right, so it could be that a large fraction of these point mutations, and the cell is just dead, right? Yeah, so this is, this is what you call a pessimistic view of nature or of life. <laughs> You know, he has trouble crossing the street because he's never sure. If, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, all right, what do you think? I would actually think that there's a much larger yeah. fraction where, um, all of, where it's exactly the same. Yeah. Because there's not a lot of point mutations that are just substitutions. Of yeah, OK, so lots of them maybe. OK, so, may, all right, so, all right, so these are the two polar views of the world, right? That well, nothing sure. matters <laughs> or you're all dead. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, okay, well, now, now I think you're being too, uh, you know, okay, how, how are we re reconciling? So we know that there's a third base pair right? Um, sure. And so there's probably like at least one third of them where it just doesn't matter at all. Where you okay. just get the same, you get the same code. Yeah, yeah. Um, although there are cases actually where even silent mutations end up changing protein expression level. All right, but yeah, no, no, all right, it's, it, it, I don't know if this reconciles the two views of the world, but. Um, <laughs> Right, you know, and then I'd say, um, you know, and then some, right, so some people have drawn, um, you know, things that look like this, something, or some people have drawn things that look like this, sometimes, yeah, so I'd say that we have, and we have a uniform distribution. <laughs> um, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna make a null model, I mean, yeah, I don't know, okay. All right, so I would say that we, we have enough information to say that something about what this thing should look like, okay. Um, all right, so first of all, um, you know, uh, some fraction of genes are indeed essential. Right? So you know, we know that if you remove, you know, 10, 20 percent of a gene, you know, for 10 or 20 percent of the genes, if you remove it, the cell is dead. Okay? That doesn't mean that 10 to 20 percent of point mutations will lead to a lethal, uh, lethal phenotype. But it means that if you if you do um, inactivate or knock out that uh, gene, then it will be lethal. Okay. So that means that there are indeed some set of uh, these point mutations that are going to be lethal, but it's going to be small. I, you know, I and I, I don't know what the actual number would be, but you know, maybe one in ten to the four, uh, something, something small, right? Because it might, you know, because it's probably only ten percent of the locations on the gene would actually knock it out. Okay, I'm making up that number. Uh, the pro the protein guys would have a much better sense. But it's going, to be a, it's going to be a small number. It might only be 1% of the mutations actually would actually, would actually knock out the function of the protein. Right? And then um, not all of the genome actually codes for proteins. Right? So you start multiplying small numbers together, and you get something that's rather small. But there, but there will be some number of mutations there. Uh, however, the vast majority of mutations will have no measurable fitness effect. Okay? So indeed, this thing kind of peaks here. Um, and, and then rather sharply comes down. I mean, this is on a linear scale or something like that. Right? 
So it, the width might indeed be you know, a few percent. Um, but actually, you know, probably even less, maybe 1% or half, you know, something small. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's, on a linear scale, it doesn't look skewed. On a log scale, I think it does. I mean, in the sense, if, if, you, it, um, if you plot log frequency on this axis, then there's a longer tail on the left than on the right. But I'd say on a linear scale, it's, it's just a pretty sharp function there. All right, so people have measured, certainly for all the gene knockouts, we've, we have measured this. And that's, that's things, even that distribution is, is sharply peaked. Right, so the point mutation distribution is going to be even more, even more tightly peaked. Yeah, yeah, so, so for most genes, at least in many environments, right, and of course you, it depends on what environment you measure, then, but for most genes, you can, you can knock them out. Certainly in rich media, most genes you can knock out. All right, so this is, um, you know, and then of course there are, you know, it, yeah, th this, as I said, might be 1 in 10 to the minus 3, 4, all, uh, okay. Um, you know, it's, I, I might be off by a couple orders of magnitude, okay, but the point is that this is, um, it's, it's a small fraction over here. Most, most are here, and, and there will be some point mutations that come down here, but, you know, on a linear scale, they're going to be, it's going to be very small. Um, okay, now from the standpoint of a population evolving to a new environment, which mutations are we most interested in? The beneficial mutations, right? So we're most interested in, uh, in these guys. Okay. Um, and indeed, this is the distribution that, that um, Hegernus and Koshoni set out to try and measure in that experiment that, um, that we just read about last night. So he wanted to know if you plot, if you kind of zoom in here, because remember this, this is even narrower than I've actually drawn, right? Um, but this distribution, the probability of a beneficial mutation of magnitude s, s here zero, s, um, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna do something, right? Many mutations that are nearly neutral, but it's gonna fall off in some way, and they wanted to try and measure this, right? Now, how many mutations confer a 2% advantage, 4%, you know, for this particular E. coli strain in that particular environment? Okay. But it turned out being difficult to measure. Right. And, and what was the reason that they gave for why it was difficult to measure? Somebody, anybody, please? Yes, but okay, but the equivalence principle doesn't say that they're all equivalent necessarily. Well, well you, you can pick different parameters for the So there are different distributions, and they each have their parameters. Yeah. So you can pick parameters for each of them such that they will give you the same. Um, the, okay, that's right. Right. So what they found was that different underlying distributions, this probability distribution for beneficial mutations, function of s, different underlying distributions could give you the same final output in their measurements. Okay, but why was that? Yeah, John. Right, so you can only measure what it fixes or what become, uh, or becomes significant for actual population, 10%, you know. Only measure what fixes or grows. And what does that mean? Well, it means that you're not probing right, it means that we're not probing that distribution, and why not? Yeah, okay, but yeah, but why is it that we only see part of this distribution? I mean, what, what was there? I mean, we don't see the ones that die out. We don't see the ones that die out, and 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 why is it that they die out, or why is it that they? Okay, right, okay, yeah. So stochastic, yeah, not. Um, Yes, the, so the, the effect of stochastic extinction is very relevant here. Uh, and I think that in this paper, they a little bit underplay the, that aspect of it, right? Because they're primarily arguing that it was another effect that led, led to this equivalence principle, right? Yeah, clonal interference, right? I mean, that's why we spent the last hour talking about clonal interference, 
right? So their, their, their argument that in this paper was that uh, as a result of clonal interference, competition between these different lineages, then the distribution of fitness effects that you measure that fix is not the distribution that was the underlying distribution. Okay? Because less fit mutations, less fit beneficial mutations get outcompeted. Okay? But there's a very important question, which is let's imagine that we have, let's have mu go to 0. Okay? Or we go to small populations. Let's, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's say that uh, after reading his paper, I said, OK, well, yeah, because of clonal interference, I can't measure this probability distribution in the setup that he used. But maybe if I go to small population sizes or I reduce the mutation rate somehow, magic, okay, then would this allow me to measure that distribution? Right? So I'm going to ask you guys to vote. So let's say I experimentally have mu go to 0. Does this mean that when I then go do my right, CFP, YFP, right, they're 50-50, and then you start doing this, and we measure the slope to get S, right, just like in this experiment. Okay. Will I extract, if I plot the distribution of resulting S's, Okay. No clonal interference anymore, right? Because I've set mu equal to zero. So this thing goes to infinity, right? Do I recover this uh, the underlying distribution? Okay, ready? Okay, so P B measured, is it as a function of S, is it equal to the underlying the true one? Question mark. All right, I'm going to give you 15 seconds to think about this. All right, ready? Three, two, one. All right, so we have many, uh, you know, I'd say majority of no's. OK, and can somebody say why not? We can't always see the established. That's right, because even if you don't have clonal interference, you still only see the mutations that survive stochastic extinction. Okay. And I think this is a really important point that, at least in a first reading of the paper, you might not realize. Uh, yeah, Jean. That's right. So in principle, we know that it, it, it that the probability of survival goes as s, right? Um, but I'm just but you end up losing a fair amount of information, right? So for example, let's say that this thing is an exponential. Okay, so this is p b of s. Let's just say I, I, I it's an exponential, um, and indeed from some ideas from extreme value theory, uh, there are arguments that maybe this should be an exponential. Okay, and if you're curious about this, come and ask me after class. All right, but uh, let's just imagine that this thing is exponential. Uh, now the question is, what would we actually measure in the limit of in this experiment in the absence of clonal interference? All right, would we measure a distribution that would be would the distribution be maximal at zero or at some other value? Verbally, zero or other value. Ready? Three, two, one. Other value, right? And indeed, the probability of surviving extinction, remember this x1 goes as s, means that the distribution that you actually measure will start at 0, grow linearly, okay? and, then, uh, and then fall off. Okay? So this distribution is essentially like this distribution of the convolution of two exponentials, okay? where um, this, thing should, this thing goes up linearly and then, and then curves off. So I think that a very important point to, to realize in all this is that this is p. This is probability distribution that's measured as a function of s with no clonal interference, right? All right so the statement is that even if you don't have any clonal interference, already you're going to measure a peak distribution, right? Even if the underlying distribution is, you know, it's going to be the underlying distribution will be peaked at zero, right? Uh, and then, um, but the, but what you measure is always going to be peaked somewhere else. And indeed, if you go and you look in the, fi in the paper at the measured alpha as a function of s, what you see is something that looks kind of like this. So 
uh, it's a little bit difficult to be absolutely certain. What's going on is that in the absence of clonal interference, you get this. With clonal interference, let's say you have two mutations. And you want to know, OK, what are you going to measure? Well, you sample from this distribution twice, and you take the larger of the two. Because right? this distribution is already the probability distribution of mutations that get established. Right? So then this is going to grow as, uh, as a quadratic here. If you have more clonal interference, then this thing shifts to the right and gets tighter. Right? So this is, the, this is kind of the process by which you end up with a peaked distribution. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to start uh, by the first, in the first 15 minutes on Tuesday. We'll, um, we'll talk about this experiment uh, a bit more. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we'll go on to think about, uh, about fitness landscapes and, uh, and the rate of evolution. If you have any questions about anything that we said, uh, please come on up. Okay.